I would like to present Didier Ribon, who is a philosopher, who is an author, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Amiens, and who is the author of many books, including, I'll just uh, talk about the three um, that have been uh, published in, in English translation. He's, he's the author of many books on a variety of subjects, notably um, in philosophy and sociology. Um, his, uh, his first big huge success was um, Michel Foucault, um, a standard biography of Michel Foucault, published in France in 1989 and translated uh, into English in 1990, translated by Patsy Wang and published by Harvard University Press in 1991. Um, and then several books later, he published Reflexions sur la question gay, which of course, the French title of which of course is, uh, refers to uh, Sartre's Reflexions sur la question juive, a reference that doesn't really come across in the English translation, but I thought I would know it here. It was, uh, so that was published in 1999, um, and it was uh, translated as Insult and the Making of the Gay Self. It was translated by Michael Lucy and published in 2004 as a, under the title Insult and the Making of the Gay Self by Duke University Press. Um, and then, uh, so Didier Ribon uh, had been a major figure in the uh, French intellectual uh, scene for many years, but for t 20 years. Um, but uh, Retour à Reims really got him a, um, a, new, uh, a new audience and a new sort of um, Presence because of its um, because of its more narrative um, uh, bent, uh, generic bent, but also because um, so Le Tour à Reims is um, is the unclasses the, the book that uh, has just been published in English as Returning to Reims, published by our very own semiotext associated with proudly for decades with the French department. At, um, at Columbia and distributed by the MIT Press. So this has just come out, translated also by Michael Lucy, um, under the title Returning to Haas. And this book is um, quite a remarkable one because in this book, um, Didier Ribon uh, talks about the intersection, uh, Didier Ribon, who has been um, one of the major, probably the major, um, theorist and uh, commentator on uh, gay issues in France in the last few decades. Uh, Didier Ribon talks about, and talks in an autobiographical vein, about the intersection between class and sexuality with very interesting um, and compelling uh, and provocative results in this book. This book so has been translated um, into English. It's also been turned into a play, which will have its premiere at the Avignon Festival. Uh, so this book is really, uh, this book was hailed by Annie Arnaud um, when it came out as um, being truly groundbreaking. And it is truly ground groundbreaking. Um, this had never been done before. Um, uh, and yeah, and it was hailed by Annie Arnaud in the Nouvelle Obsession, a big article in the Nouvelle Obsession to um, to uh, to great prominence um, and so um, so before I announce the title of uh, Didier Ribon's talk this evening I would like to say that we have um, a remarkable um, occasion as well here this evening um, we have with us not merely uh, Didier Ribon not that Didier Ribon is ever mere um, but we also have with us someone who um, has been at the top of the bestseller list in France for the last few months. Um, we have here the author, Edouard Louis, author of En Finir avec Eddie Belgo, which has been uh, a bestseller, which has been tremendously uh, talked about, a huge bestseller for the last few months. This book is um, dedicated to Didier Ribon. It's, um, it is billed as a novel. It is a novel. Um, it is, uh, it takes up many of the same themes as uh, Retour à Reims, and um, the uh, author, Edouard Louis, is here with us today, and he has graciously agreed to engage in a dialogue after Didier's talk. So here's what we'll, we'll have Didier's talk, which is entitled On Social Verdicts, and will be delivered in English, titled On Social Verdicts, 
classes, identities, trajectories. We'll have some discussion about that, and then we will have a discussion with Didier Eribon and Edouard Louis to, uh, to conclude. First published in French in 2009, as well as in the book that followed, La Société comme Verdict, which has not been uh, yet translated into English, published in 2013, in order to present, in a succinct manner, of course, the theory of subjectivity and of social identities that I attempted to elaborate in this diptych that I called my return series. The question I propose to take up with you before you today is obviously a difficult one. I'm, of course, hardly the first one to pose it, and in fact, I wonder if it does not necessarily emerge, however implicitly, in any project of writing about oneself, whether that writing be categorized as fiction, autobiography, or self-analysis, especially self-analysis, of course. The question I refer to is this question, who is speaking, who is writing in the autobiographical project? You understand the, the famous sentence asked by Foucault referring to Beckett, qu'importe qui parle, what does it matter, who is speaking, asked Foucault, in his structuralist moment, or if you prefer, his Beckettian moment. But it is enough to read, for example, Simone de Beauvoir, Violet Le Duc, Tony Morrison, or Aimé Césaire, Franz Fanon, Edouard Glissant, or André Gide, Jean Genet, or Monique Wittig, or most, more, more recently, Annie Ernaud and Patrick Chamoiseau. And I would add that um, it is enough to read Foucault himself to see that one can hardly stop at Foucault's formula, can both keep up. On the contrary, we need. On the contrary, we need to perceive and to understand the implication of a subject who speaks or writes in what he or she says or writes, and to trace the historical and social genealogy of that implication. This might even be the principal lesson to be drawn from Michel Foucault's epub, to perform the diagnosis of the present, or what he called the critical ontology of ourselves, as he proposes in a late text, is necessarily to map the genealogy of what we are, but this genealogy can only be reconstructed through a plural approach. It is a question of diagnosis, plural, ontologies of ourselves. Historical temporality cannot be unified or united in a great synthesis that each of us would incarnate or embody. There are multiple presents which are different for each of us depending on the collectivities, the group, the categories, the ontologies to which we are attached or referred by history. Which is to say by power, the operation of power, and by the resistance to power or to powers, by subjectification and desubjectification, dis dis assujettissement et désassujettissement. Indeed, who is speaking when one speaks or writes about oneself? And about whom is one speaking? I mean to say, who is the me who writes and who is the me that is written about? Any work of self-analysis implicitly contains a theory of the subject and of the processes of subjectification. When I originally, originally sent returning to Rennes to my editor, it had a subtitle which was precisely a theory of the subject. A last minute, minute change from a political theory of the subject. My editor worried this subtitle would deter potential readers, advised me to remove it. At first, of course, I refused, reluctant, as you can imagine, to allow the presentation of the book to be determined by commercial considerations. But in the end, I agreed, figuring that it was not necessary for me to insist that the book would be about theory, 
that I consider it to be a work of theoretical reflection, as if I wanted to prescribe the way it should be read. But with or without the subtitle, that is indeed what I sought to elaborate, a theory, a social and political theory of the subject. What is the I? What is an individual? This question was not a new one for me. After all, my book, my 1999 book published in French as Réflexion sur la question gay, in reference to Sartre, as Elisabeth uh, mentioned uh, previously before, in, to Sartre's Réflexion sur la question juive, a, a book which asks how we define belonging to a group, and particularly to a minority group that is deemed inferior, persecuted, appeared in English translation as insert on the making of the gay self. I was not, in the beginning, very enthusiastic about this title, the English title, chosen by the editor. But in the end, it conveys quite well the book's aim, namely to show how insert, which is to say not only words intended to wound, words in the street, for example, but also the entirety of social discourse, of the hierarchies instituted by language, assigns a defined place to a group of individuals and to show how these effects of categorization are constitutive of the subjectivity of individuals insofar as they are attached to a collective, to a group, whether they seek to be or not, whether they accept it or not. The individual is defined through this belonging. The subject Subjectivity is defined through this process of subjectification, assujettissement, and by the deploying of its categorization in the form of counter discourse, which is to say the reappropriation of insert in the affirmation of self, the transformation, for example, of shame into pride. This theme is omnipresent, for example, in Jean Genet's work, as Sartre very well understood and demonstrated. As soon as we reflect on self-analysis and on the formation of subjects, we inevitably come up against the question of psychoanalysis. When I, we discussed that yesterday at NYU, it was, uh, but um, we can discuss that today, tonight too. When I was writing, returning to uh, the question of psychoanalysis, when I was writing, returning to Rams, my methodology was quite simply non-psychoanalytic. My approach throughout was social and not psychological. In fact, psychology had no place in the project, which for me seemed to go without saying. But it is impossible to leave aside psychoanalysis without being reminded of it in innumerable ways, since psychoanalysis saturates our culture. It is First, not possible to simply leave aside psychoanalysis and to make no reference to it whatsoever. The only option is to affirm that one is refusing it and to explain why one seeks not to engage it. A friend of mine with whom I was dining one evening when I was writing Retouarens declared to me, you who have published a book called Echappé à la psychanalyse, I don't know how to translate it into English, escaping psychoanalysis, or leave, I would prefer leaving psychoanalysis behind. Um, you have published a book called Echappé à la psychanalyse, escaping psychoanalysis. How are you going to be able to speak of your relations with your father, with your mother? You will be forced to turn to notions like Oedipus, the Oedipus complex. So at that moment I realized that a book such as this one I was writing could not simply be non-psychoanalytical. It had to affirm its resolutely anti-psychoanalytical stance. So I added in the book a few paragraphs, underscoring explicitly that any psychoanalytical approach in confining its analysis to the level of the individual or of a collective limited to the family circle as such serves to that extent to desocialize, dehistorize, and dehistoricize, and thus depoliticize the problems I hoped to address. 
When I say depoliticize, I should say rather politicize in a depoliticizing way, but thus actually very political in that it evacuates the social dimension, the class dimension in particular, in particular but not only that, race uh, dimension, for example, ethnic, uh, ethnicity and so on. Psychoanalysis tends at once to singular, singular, singularize the processes it accounts for and at the same time to universalize them in any given case for this or that individual it proceeds by analyzing the way psychic mechanism functions that are apparently the same for every run and can be fitted into a set of grand categories like the Oedipus complex. A universal framework of analysis is applied to every particular case. The formation of the psyche is thus reduced to the space of the family organized around the figure or triangle, the father, the mother, the children. But individual cases are never just individual cases. They are rooted in larger social categories of class, gender, race, and ethnicity. Could add some other dimensions. To no longer belong to, for example, to the same class as one parents can be a cause of conflict, incomprehension, distance between children and parents. We see this clearly in any number of works of literature. The relation between parents and their children can become difficult, not because of psychic conflicts inherent to the family structure or quasi-necessary stages of the human subject's development, but rather, for example, because of too great a difference in their respective relation to school. Say, an early exit from the school system by the working class parents, where the children stay longer and sometimes have access to better instruction. That's fundamentally what is on view in the novels of Annie Ernaud, for example, of Pierre Perguignou, or more recently, Edouard Louis, among French authors, or John Edgar Reitman, whose brothers and keepers magnificently and painfully takes up the question of an upward social trajectory and the profound differentiation it establishes from those one leaves behind or from whom one separates oneself. I could cite dozens of other authors elaborating on similar themes and for example, I'll take one example, in his autobiography, Colored People, Henry Louis Gates Jr. described the incomprehension that can arise in any number of situations between parents who were schooled in the US at a time when segregation, segregation was still in effect and their children who went through school after desegregation. It is for this reason that it seems to me desirable to replace, to replace the Oedipus complex with the school system. And what this system produces in terms of the relation of individual to language and culture, as well as relations with others, I mean others who are differently situated in the social world, and consequently in terms of individuals' relationships to themselves as negatively situated in hierarchies of social, linguistic, cultural, and political legitimation. That's why I believe that critical theory could gain in a radicality by claiming a space for non-psychoanalytical thinking and, it's, and in tasking itself with constructing a political theory of the subject, which is to say a sociology, an anthropology, and a history of subjectivation. My arguments in France against the reactionary mobilization of psychoanalysts opposed to the rights of for example, LGBT families, homosexual parenting, and so on, led some of my readers to believe that what I was rejecting was a certain kind of reactionary deployment, conservative deployment of psychoanalysis in my country. And I know that many people were in agreement with the critics I leveled at these retrograde discourses, even while objecting 
that a different conception of psychoanalysis was possible. That may be, I don't deny it, but it does not change the heart of the problem. In fact, it is psychoanalysis itself at such that I would like to leave aside its whole conception of the unconscious and the formation of subjects. For the psychoanalytical concept of Oedipus, the father, the phallus, the law, castration, I would prefer to substitute a theory whose analysis would lean on other concepts, social verdicts, determinism, class reproduction, embodiment of the social habitus, and so on. Discipline, if you prefer the Foucaultian language. It is then a social and a political past that constitutes us and that we have to manage throughout our, our lives. At the beginning of his book on Genet, Jean-Paul Sartre describes Jean Genet as a passéiste, a man who lives in the past. A single event made, made time congeal. He was named, you are a thief. So he is and he will be a thief. From that time on, temporality is only a repetition of the same. A verdict was delivered, and this verdict fashioned the body and the mind of the man who was its object. I wonder if each of us is not in fact just as much a passeist as Jean Genet in the sense, in the sense given by Sartre to this word. Whether consciously or not, we all live in the wake of a fatal instant at which the world around us reveal to us what we are in the eyes of the others, which is to say situated us in social space with its values, its norms, its hierarchies. Hierarchies is well, impossible to pronounce for any stories today. Hierarchies. To go from hierarchy to hierarchies is, is an effort. A relative effort. So, excuse me. Nomination, interpellation, insert, these are verdicts rendered by a court which does not sit and thus from which it is difficult to ask for explanation. As in Kafka, this court cannot be located because in fact it is nowhere, or rather, or better, it is everywhere. It is a court whose sentences are repeated by the whole social order, since the social order that reproduces and perpetuates itself is just that, the collection of all the verdicts that define what we are, what each of us is. For what we are has always been circumscribed by an event. For example, the insert that inscribes us within a category you are a faggot, for example. You, you don't know what you are, and somebody tells you what you are. You become what you, the insert tells you that you are, uh, this or that. And that even can be finally birth itself, which gives us a social location to be the son of a daughter of a working class family, to mark that a social location that marks us forever whether we stay in the milieu in which we are born or whether we leave it. The social milieu to which one belongs defines the horizon of professional aspiration, and the school system distributes children differentially depending on their social, racial, or ethnic background. There are what we call, what we can call here, effects of fate connected to social origin and ratified, reinforced by the school system. It is via the intermediary of the school system that the social structure reproduces itself. And it is the social inequalities inscribed in one's origins that repeat and reproduce themselves, the possession or not at the origin and the birth of cultural capital. What Bourdieu so powerfully demonstrated is so clearly confirmed in our daily experience that I don't know how anyone could doubt it or deny it. But there are other kinds of verdict. Consider Violet Ludwig, the French writer. The film has just been released about her. Um, 
it's very interesting to see the interaction between uh, the Atlantic and Simon de Beauvoir. But anyway, um, consider the Atlantic. The misfortunate that weighs on her is that of having been born a bastard, as the title of the first, of the first volume of her astounding autobiography, the test, the bastard, the bastard. That category pre exists her, uh, the shameful and despised category at the time of a child without a father. And for her mother, it is the category of the single mother with a daughter without having a husband or at least a partner. I quote, My mother never held my hand. Ma mère ne m'a jamais tenu la main. This is the first sentence of her book, one of her first book, L'Asphyxie, translated, I think, in English as in the prison of skin. And the very idea of the asphyxie, the asphyxiation, in this context, emphasizes that a social structure takes hold of her and constructs, constructs what she is and what she will be, for she will carry with her forever the weight of this inaugural misfortune, this inaugural verdict, sentence, pronounced by a court, which is the norms of the, of the society, social norms. And we all bear in bear, bear in sorry, bear is something else. <laughs> Later. We all bear in ourselves the map of the place and the view we were born into. The place that is one of the most famous novels by Annie Arnaud, the title is La Place, the place. And the place that is proper to us, for which was once ours and now remains present in all the subsequent situations of our lives, in spite of everything that changes. I have said that the social world takes hold of us at birth, but it takes hold of us even long before that. We go far back in time. For example, the first volume of the autobiography of Asya Jeba, the Algerian um, uh, writer, Found in, in French, it is L'amour, la fantasia, it is translated as Fantasia and Algerian Cavalcade. Opens on a scene of battle. It takes place in 1830. It's the, the capture of Algiers by French troops and the beginning of a long and murderous war conducted by the French army aimed at destroying the resistance and forcing the colonized country to submit. At the very end of this book, this first installment, after having evoked both her personal history and the history of the Algerian Arger Wars, the war waged by the French just before the middle of the 19th century <coughs> to conquer the country, then the war waged by the French in the middle of the 20th century, century to maintain its control in the face of the rising forces of liberation and independence, so at the end of this book, Asir Jebar writes, a conclusion arises, I was born in 1842, which is to say, at the moment the French troops destroyed the village of her ancestors, the village of her tribe of origin, ma tribu d'origine, as she writes. We can see here, here that the first question that underpins any project of autobiography and even more so in the project of self-analysis, is a question of the date of birth, not that of the identity documents, but that of, or the state registration, but that of the condition, of the historical sequence which one, in which one is inscribed, of the geographical and political situation of which one is the product, and in this case, of the military and colonial violence. The question can be posed in these terms. Where and when does autobiography begin? I mean, how far back, how far back in time do we date? In which territory can we affix our beginnings? Where and when do I begin? The me is a composite of history and geography, as we can see in uh, Asia Jebar's novel, Autobiography, and it is this composition that makes us what we are, which strongly resembles 
what starts one's called a predestination, predestination. But Asia Jeba, I would add a point about Asia Jeba, can only write because she is carried by the voice of the executed. She was born in 1842 in the glow of the blazes of war and in the shadow of massacres. Through her, it is all the others, the holy story that speaks, the holy story from which she issued. But, as I have just uh, uh, hinted, Asia Jeba writes in French. She writes in the enemy tongue, la langue adverse, la langue de l'adversaire, as she puts it, la langue adverse. It is, in, in, uh, as she puts it in some complex passages, as speaker of French, she is thus also born at the moment of invasion. She writes in the language of the colonizer. And she is, of course, aware of it, of this, and she reflects on this. And if I understand correctly the passage I'm referring to, which is a complex and difficult passage, and the surrounding pages, she is suggesting that it is also in her connection to France, to French culture, and to French literature, that she developed, she could develop the desire for emancipation for, for a woman, for the tradition of her country, and from the culture, as she described it symbolically in the fact of removing her veil. The unveiling of the self in the language of the enemy is also the story of an emancipation, an unveiling of the self that distinguishes her from those she calls my clustered companions, my companions voitrées. So, what she called the exercise of autobiography in the language of the past enemy, as she puts it, thus delivers us to the fact that each sentence she writes, however banal, also reanimates the old war between two people. It is the language of the colonizers that she evokes, in the language of the colonizer that she evokes, the history of the colonized. It is in the language of the oppressor that she gives voice to the oppressed. But she writes books in the language through which she forged the relationship to culture and the concept for herself of emancipation, the concept of the reality for herself of emancipation. I like very much the work of Asia Jeba, considered, for example, the magnificent, Le Blanc d'Algérie, uh, Algerian white, it's about born in Algeria, and about the, the, the dead friends, it's, it's a wonderful book. But my point here is not so much to offer a commentary on her work as to take up her interrogation of what it means to write in the language of the enemy, what it is to write on domination in the dominant language or the language of the dominators. To write in the language of the enemy, that is also a phrase from Jean Genet that Annie Arnaud likes to cite. The question of the language of the enemy opens onto a more general question of the categories of thought through which we can analyze domination and take account of the principles of domination. Can we simply dispense with the categories that subject, subjective, subject, subjugate us and subjectify us, nous assujettis, nous soumet, or are we not necessarily caught in the frame of these categories as Foucault invited, invited us to think with his idea of discourse as a strategic configuration according to which critical or heretical discourse necessarily leans on the discourse of power it resists. I'd like to return a few minutes to the question of the depths of the past we uh, constitute and consider as ours. The whole world of uh, John Edgar Whiteman I already mentioned is an attempt to go as far back as possible in the genealogy from which he springs. We can see in his superb book Father Long how the question of personal identity is linked to collective identity, and how the letter, the letter, 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 let
that the latter is rooted in history. His aim in that book is to discover his father's past, his father's family's past, and in what, in, in that way, to make out in the depths of the past his connection to Africa. In a way very similar to the proclamation of negritude, as described by Aimé Césaire, Léopold Senghor, or Léon Gontran Damas. But at the same time, he prophesies to detest, to detest, to, to vomit the toxic cloud that descends along with the notions of race. He insists at length in this book on the toxicity of the categories of race, of racial categorization. So the question is how to undo race when one has been constituted by race and wants to affirm one's past and present as belonging to that race, to affirm race and at the same time to refuse it. Here we arrive at a contradiction, or at least a tension, one that is probably constitutive to any political strategy for transforming the social order. This is no doubt an example of, of what John Scott referred to in relation to the feminist movement as an unresolvable paradox, a paradox insurmontable, how to assert difference in making a claim on equality. Since I'm speaking at the same time of race and of feminism, I would like to conclude with the question of multiple belongings in returning naturally to Kim Berry Crenshaw's famous article, Mapping the Margins, and to the notion she elaborates there, namely the notion of intersection and the intersectionality. What is often remembered from this article is conscious critique, harsh critique of the way white, bourgeois, middle-class feminism ignores the dimension of race. But we, don't, we must not forget, in fact, the critique she raised is just as much directed at the way the African-American or anti-racist movement ignores the dimension of gender. In the short time that remains for me in a few minutes I want to conclude, I cannot offer a discussion that would do justice the, to the richness and fecundity of Crenshaw's article. But by way of conclusion, I would like to extend some of its insights. Which, eat, which we, we each sit at the intersection of multiple histories, multiple histories, historical inscription, and the singularity of each of us consists in the fact that the set of intersection that constitutes us differs from the set that constitutes this or that other person. But equally, political movements and contemporary political categories not only give a form to the present, but also to the past, which is our past precisely, which become our past precisely in, his, in insisting on a particular aspect of it. For example, the LGBT movement, I'm going back to returning to it, the LGBT movement had given me the past as a gay child, and it's quite me in a gay history. I was born in 1895 when Oscar Wilde was sent to Art Labor, for example. In so doing, it made me forget the worker's child I also was, whose existence no discourse or no theoretical category could uphold since Marxism all but disappeared from the French intellectual scene. Can I reconcile these different histories? Can I globalize, totalize the elements that constitute me? Can I reunite their divergent temporalities? Or must I admit that political time can never be unified? To politicize is to make present certain dimensions of social life to the detriment of others that remain virtual. As a consequence, each theoretical category inscribes me in a history, in a genealogy, which will be in conflict and in competition with the theoretical categories that would inscribe me in a different history, a different temporality. 
It is not enough to say, and it is perhaps not quite correct to say, that I am situated at the intersection of multiple temporalities because the crystallization that constitutes the I is always fragile, provisional, contingent, and above all incomplete. The I is haunted by the other I's that are necessary, necessarily excluded, elided, expelled from the present in order that an I can emerge and can define itself as such. This dilemma that concerns the subject, the formation of the subject, applies equally to groups and to the constitution of political reality. We must not dream, we must not dream, other than in ephemeral moments destined to disappear as quickly as they arise, of a convergence of political struggles, of coalition in which divergent political prisons would come together in a perfect fusion. We must not dream of that. Is a historical one. 
But I couldn't, because the, the LGBT movement was very strong at that time, and when I started writing, and Max Lemes disappeared from the French, and more broadly, the, the European uh, uh, political scene, um, and discourse, and theory, I couldn't, and I referred to my, uh, to, my, to Marxism, the Marxism that was so uh, prominent in my, in my teenager, in teenager's years, I, I could have inscribed myself in, in a different history, for example, La Commune de Paris in 1870. So it would be a different birth, uh, uh, date of birth, and a different history giving me uh, a different identity. So the identity the personal identity is, is produced by the category, the, the, the contemporary categories of politics in which we are involved at the present time. So the, the, the politics does not define only what you are or, or frame only what you are at the present moment, but gives you a past. And not only a personal past, but a historical collective past. And I'm trying to reflect, can I can I be, at the same time, um, someone who is inscribed in the history which begins with the working class movement in France, uh, about which uh, Karl Marx so powerfully uh, um, uh, wrote wonderful books uh, uh, like Lutte de classe en France, uh, and so on. And at the same time, can I? Um, Another identity, which is uh, the gay male uh, living in uh, intellectual, intellectual circles in Paris. So I have, uh, and reading Jean Genet, read the, the book, the books you choose to read, because if you recognize yourself in that, uh, in the pages of the books, is also a way of giving you an identity, a historical identity, but. It's a choice. You can. Uh, um, I could have re read instead of uh, um, the question raised by Kimberly Kutcher is very important, uh, but it, it's uh, it must be it must be it must not be uh, simply quoted, cited, and uh, repeated, but it must be constantly re-elaborated. And I wonder whether one can be at the same time too political persons in one set. And of course, uh, when I say it's a dream, um, I would like to be uh, involved in different movements at the same time, which would be a unique global uh, struggle, uh, uniting all the struggles together, which, for example, uh, happened in France in May 1968, but in May 1968 were two months. In France, and then uh, the struggles, uh, feminist movement, gay movement, working class movement, um, follow their own uh, paths in their own ways. So uh, I, I don't. Well, I realize I don't understand. I, I don't. Uh, I understand. I cannot answer your question. But um, well. <laughs> It will be the we can we can perhaps leave this uh, on yeah. the back burner for the moment. I'm sure there are other questions. There's a question. Oh, sorry, there's a question right here. Um, I have a question about the, the, the choices you've made. Uh, you just explained that uh, I mean we, we choose uh, the text we read. In your talk you mentioned many times Sartre and only to insist to to, to, to use Sartre as a you know when it speaks about determination, over determination. That the fact that this is actually the first statement directive of the affirmation of pure freedom. Uh, and something that Pierre Bourdieu has uh, commented upon, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the idea of pure freedom is a complete illusion that is itself determined by social uh, determinations. So uh, I was wondering where you stand here. Um, Pierre Bourdieu 
seems to me that there's a, it, it, it seems to me that some of the screen of your uh, analysis, um, there is space for freedom in what we call the, the jeu, the play, in yeah. between different spaces. So maybe in the uh, intersections of intersectionality, there is some game, some space, some leeway uh, that you know allows for you know choices. Um, I was wondering what you know, because the thing you talk was about you know, determinations and we determine by uh, and, you start to and, 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 and then you start to, to say that what where is the how do you you know uh, yeah. account for um, for your own trajectory and for the, 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 the freedom you have to respect on it? You know, the book by Sartre Saint Germain has been so influential on me that I have read it several times. But I am now uh, rereading it because I will give a talk at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris about rereading Saint Germain and uh, trying to think uh, what is a social identity without uh, referring to Marxism and to psychoanalysis and uh, without. And, um, this is the project of the book, of the Sartre's book. So I was very interested, I am very interested in that attempt, which maybe is, 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 is a failure, but it's a wonderful failure. And um, I'm very, very impressed by how Sartre considered that um, you know, is the notion of interpolation, you are, nomination, you are nominated, you are named, and the, that nomination gives you an identity. And, the only way of, uh, of um, getting some freedom from this identity which has been imposed on you is to appropriate it for yourself. You are a thief, yes I am a thief, I will be the thief. And, um, and to transform your status as an object of the gaze of the other in the, um, being yourself the subject of your discourse, but you cannot escape what the other has made you, uh, in, uh, um, the identity that the others, uh, the gaze that the other uh, gave you. So there was a, um, a huge place for freedom, for emancipation, I don't like the word emancipation, um, but for, for, for freedom, an attempt to, not freedom, but to free oneself, to, to, to so anyway, um, to, 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 to open to open a space of freedom to 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 open the to open a space for for freedom. To, but obviously, and you're right to, to, to point to that, that my, my reading of Sartre, and especially of that book, which is for me one of his most important book, is uh, a Bourdieuian reading of Sartre. And uh, how, je how Sartre insists on the verdict, the social verdict, the nomination, his name, and the category through which he his name is a social category which pre-exists the nomination. So there is a category, a social structure, in which through the naming, in, through the interpolation, in which Genet is put and in which he has to fit. So this is not an interpretation, this is exactly the first pages of the, of the book. But I would say that we cannot, we can never escape the nomination. And here, I'm, uh, I'm trying to, to reconcile, I'm always against reconciliation for always for divergences and uh, differences, but here I would like to reconcile Sartre and Bourdieu and Foucault on, the, on this idea that we cannot undo completely what the social order is made of. always been constituted by the social order. And for example, um, as a working class uh, child, 
uh, at the education of a working class child. And I would not have succeeded in the academic world with a lot of difficulties had I not been a gay man. Because, uh, and I, I answer the question to wait for Elizabeth now, because um, my trajectory linked to a sexual identity is a miracle. And the miracle is a name, which is homosexuality, which brings different classes together. I don't, I, I don't have the illusion that uh, there is no class issue in um, the gay world, of course. But I was able, when I, when I was 20, 21, I was able to meet people from different extraction, social, from different social classes, which helped me to become somebody else, and uh, which gave me models, which gave me um, a culture I didn't. Uh, and, uh, but I wanted to, to be, because I was differing from my parents, from my family, from my milieu, I tried my best to defer uh, more and more. I was a different child, a kind of dissenting child, because I, it was a dissent. Uh, I did not uh, abide to, I abide to more uh, um, masculinist norms and uh, values uh, which were prominent in my milieu. And I was not that, um, that young guy uh, I should have been. I was not. And because I was not, uh, I was attracted to something else, to culture, to literature, to uh, intellectual life. And I must say that while my brother were, were, was uh, laying soccer in the, in the surrounding of uh, where we lived, I was reading Simone de Beauvoir and uh, fantasy, with a fantasy of uh, fancying myself of, as being part of the world she described. And I wanted to be that. And so, so uh, as I put it in my last class society converting, said Saint and Beauvoir were very generous writers because they offered us, um, they, they were writing for readers to help them to become what they wanted to, what they, 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 they could want to, to become. And so, uh, I don't like when people uh, are critics to Archie Beauvoir and Sartre because I, I owe so much to them. And, um, and then, for example, you see, Sartre helped Jeanne to, 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 to be well known, but Beauvoir helped Violet Logic. And these two writers, famous writers at that time, Jean, um, Jean Paul Sartre and uh, Simone de Beauvoir, helped uh, gay and lesbian literature to emerge in France. And it was very important for the French culture to they did that. And it worked okay. okay. There was one more question at the back and then we can go Yeah, this, this should be a bit of an easier question to answer. It's more straightforward. But um, you're talking about two things, the LGBT movement, and you started to talk about sort of the workers' movement, and kind of the, um, how Marxism star, I guess you could say, fell as the LGBT movement rose sort of speaking generally. Someone who tries to sort of um, uh, create a, a convergence of those two things, I think, in his work is Daniel Guerin. It's my chance to mispronounce something. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on whether you found his work at all useful or interesting in, in your exploration. You know, I read Daniel Guerin when I was um, an adolescent. I was a Trotskyist adolescent, and I read his book on uh, um, French Revolution, French working class movement, and so on. But I have not read his book on sexuality, which were not available at that time, or um, I didn't know about them. So uh, I discovered them uh, recently, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And there can be, of course, uh, a tradition. Uh, writing which tries which 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 tries to link uh, 
sexual issues, class issues, uh, racial or ethnic issues. I, I know that, but um, this is what I'm trying to do and yeah, to reflect on that now. But um, to be honest, I have to say in my book that it's not what uh, I've been doing before. And uh, I'm trying to reflect on why I did not do that. I know that others did, uh, others did, but I did not. And why, uh, the question of the, at the beginning of the book, why um, was it for me easier to write about sexual shame, uh, the shame I, I experienced as a young gay, uh, when I was living in, uh, in Reims, and uh, all this idea of shame which is so wonderfully elaborated in Jean Genet's novel, in uh, Marcel Jumondo's uh, uh, works, and um, why was it so easier for me to write about the shame I experienced as a, as a gay than to write about the shame I experienced as a son of a worker trying to make a place for himself in a new surrounding and uh, uh, the, the French cultural bourgeoisie, and, uh, which is uh, um, Bourgeoisie is always awful, and the, the cultural bourgeoisie is as awful, <laughs> maybe as awful as the, as the other, uh, other kinds of bourgeoisie. I just want to say, so this book, everyone in France has heard of this book and has been reading this book because it has been a, an enormous, best, successful bestseller um, in the last few months. It was published in January, I think, and so um, it's kind of uh, odd because, of course, it hasn't yet been translated into English, and so um, we're talking about a phenomenon that's a big, huge deal in France, and it is not yet a big, huge deal here. So, if I may just say a few words about this. So, this is a, um, I mean, it's a roman, it's a novel. I would imagine that it's at least somewhat autobiographical. Um, and, uh, um, and so, this book is all about, um, uh, well, it's all about shame and pride and the relation between them. It recounts the story of a uh, childhood in, um, uh, in a, a working class a town in northern France and of a, a young homosexual, or a young, um, uh, I mean, I guess, well, a, 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 um, a non, a, a non, um, Jew. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I don't think that homosexuality is, is really, the, it's a matter of gender identity more than um, sexual orientation, in fact, which is why I'm searching desperately for tough, words that are tough, 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 tough. Yeah, non-tough guy, yes. Yeah, tough, tough, tough. Uh, yeah so a, a somewhat effeminate um, boy who gets, I, I mean, one thing that I found extremely interesting about this book um, is that it, so it starts out with a passage that has been excerpted all over the place and talked about endlessly of the uh, narrator getting um, beaten up and spat upon uh, by these two boys. These two boys are a very uh, actually keep, um, come back on, on a regular basis in this book. And what emerges um, at the end is uh, a somewhat redemptive scene with these two boys. But what also emerges at the end is and eroticization, and we, I mean, I think that one doesn't have to, uh, I mean, I'm certainly not going to argue with you about psychoanalysis, but I don't think that, um, I think that um, there, one can talk about psychology without talking about psychoanalysis, and I don't think that everything is explainable by uh, social categories, we can argue about that later. But in any case, what we have in the end is an eroticization of the, um, of, of the very violent oppression that is recounted throughout um, the book. And this I found, um, you know, it's certainly not the first time that this has been um, depicted, but um, this I found very interesting, especially in terms of um, the, the complicated relation between shame and pride and class and, um, and again, with the, the, um, the thing about Class, the thing about sexual shame is that it has traditionally been associated with um, a kind of a, a, a dominant classes. Oscar Wilde um, 
Mark said, Proust, for instance, um, and what you're describing about your brother, between you um, and your brothers, appears in a very different form with Charles Nusson, the Duc de Guermont, and Proust. Um, that is to say, uh, he, Charles Nusson is saved from just being a sort of stupid brute oh, in the aristocracy, and the aristocracy, stupid aristocratic brute by his homosexuality. So there are all, just all of these themes that um, are in common between these two books. Anyway, you should uh, all immediately run out and read this. Um, and uh, if you can read it in French, um, you should do so immediately. And if not, you should wait for a few minutes for it to come out in English. Uh, um, perhaps translated by Michael Lucy. I don't think so. Um, I'll translate it. Oh, ooh. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I, it's uh, anyway. It's very interesting. So these were the, these were basically the issues that um, that I wanted to try to incite you to uh, to talk about. Okay, uh, I can answer. Uh, you can say anything you want. Several things. <laughs> answer your the question you 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 want to answer. Okay. But maybe particularly uh, regarding the link between uh, social classes and sexuality. So it's an answer for several questions. And, um, and, and about the book of Didier, because we are here to talk of Didier. And uh, indeed, I, I dedicated my, my book uh, to Didier, uh, this novel to Didier, because it was uh, like when I, when I, I read uh, Returning to Us, uh, it was like the, this book uh, gave me, um, uh, like the, as you say about Sartre and etc., uh, uh, new possibilities of thinking myself, and particularly uh, possibility to escape, uh, and the idea of escape, because uh, in my novel, uh, Eddie, uh, he, he, he tried to, to escape his milieu, uh, his childhood, but, but not since the beginning. At the beginning, he, he, he absolutely wants to be like the other. He, 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 he dreams about uh, being normal, being normal, what is the normal in his childhood. And for example, when, when he feels desire uh, for the two guys uh, who spit on him every day, or who, who, who beat him every day, he doesn't feel desire for the two boys, but for the structure, you know, for the, for the masculinity uh, uh, they represent for him. Because he just, yes, it, it, his only dream is to be like the others, to be masculine, to don't be a feminine guy anymore. And, and I think this desire is not for these two guys, but for, for, yeah, for what they represent. And, um, and that's, that's why maybe the problem is how difficult is not maybe to escape, but firstly, uh, want to escape. So when I wrote this book, I, I thought it's like a, an archaeology of, of, of will, uh, why we uh, will something, and why we don't will, and why in some situations we don't even uh, uh, have the possibility of will, and have the possibility to escape, and to will to escape, to want to, to escape. And, and when I read the, the book of Didier, it gave me that possibility to want to escape. Mm -hmm. This possibility of, of wanting to escape and of, of even of, of, of lying about me, about my life. For example, when I, I read the novel <coughs> Didier, which is the story of the Alliance, which is the story of the Alliance, I read the novel, but in you were the story. You were the story. Uh, when, uh, when, uh, when I read it, I, I, I thought, uh, like, uh, oh my god, it's my life. It's the life of, of a young gay from the working class, etc. Et but when I look back, I realized that it wasn't true. It, it wasn't my life. It just gave me new possibilities to think, to think about myself. And that's why the, the, this kind of, 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 of book making and, and lying about myself. So after that, I, I started to read books, I started to write, etc. But it wasn't true, it wasn't what I am. And of course, everybody around me was saying to me, what are you playing, what role are you playing? And, um, and this, maybe this is the, the one way of, 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 cre of, of, of to create some 
spaces of liberty. It is possibility of lying offered by others and offered by gay people, for example, when you are gay. That can be a link between question of classes and question of sexuality. And, and maybe we can we can see also the theory of, of, of Sartre as a theory of, of lying. For example, mm -hmm. le pour soi, mm -hmm. when you try to be something, when you project you as something, nothing is real, nothing is your essence. You just play it, you just play this role. And the book of Didier is like, gave me so the possibility of lying about myself, of, 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 of creating projections, and, and, and maybe so, so, so gay uh, media uh, can create this kind of things like, oh, and so uh, why, who oh, is his friends, uh, etc. Et and uh, um, I wouldn't say it's exactly lying, the, 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 right, the, the right word can be lying, which um, I talked about that with your part yesterday. And, reminded me of uh, the, um, the notion of the uh, anticipatory socialization by uh, framed by uh, Merton in the American society. And um, what Merton called uh, anticipatory socialization, which means that you try to resemble, to be like uh, the milieu in which you want to uh, enter to which you want to belong. So um, you anticipate that socialization through the way of thinking of yourself, of behaving, or what you read, what you think of yourself. But I know my book gave that possibility, and the, that possibility of anticipation, anticipatory uh, socialization for you. But the difference between my book and yours, so there are a lot of differences, of course, because you wrote a novel and I wrote a book which is not a novel. The difference is that I had always been feeling that I wanted to escape and my view. And in your book that um, you have to you wait a long time for before um, thinking that what you wanted really to do was not to belong but to escape to that milieu. And you tried your best to belong, to be um, like the others, like the, the, the guys who were spitting on you, who were beating you, and um, it take, took time to you to, 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 to want to, 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 to distanciate and to, 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 to escape from this milieu. And this is, for me, one of the main differences of, of, between our two books, which makes your book so moving and so um, incredibly moving and emotionally uh, powerful and it's why I, I would say so many people uh, wanted to read it to, to and um, uh, sending you letters or emails saying um, this is my story where you describing even if the stories were very <laughs> different Surely it's, it's the emphasis, it's the relation, it seems to me, between shame and pride that makes people respond that way. Mm -hmm. Yes, because, uh, yes uh, to, because we talk a lot about escape, and I think that uh, pride, uh, uh, it's one of the modality of escaping yourself, uh, to yourself, escaping yourself, mm -hmm. um, escaping yourself. And, uh, I think that uh, yeah, that a book like the book of Didier uh, bring this kind of, 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 of thinking of the and of course this this escape take uh, is is beginning in structure in the shape. So the, this is a situation as that was said, and this is the the show, this is the society, and, 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 the, and the, the, the the pride is like an escape from from this, and I think that. Someone, uh, something very new uh, in the approach of, of, of Didier's book is, is, is this idea of, of uh, escaping uh, as a new way of thinking, uh, quality, emancipation. And you know, in, in many situations, we think uh, escape as facility, as, uh, you know, as don't, as, sorry, no. not be brave, etc. And, and many books 
like I don't know, like psychoanalysis, like like uh, uh, malaise dans la civilisation de Freud uh, dealt with how to inscribe civilization and its discontents. To inscribe to answer the question that I was not able to answer a few minutes ago, um, why is it? Why was it impossible for me, and why is it impossible for you so far uh, to reconcile the milieu of origin, the working class background, to a uh, 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 location in which we were raised and in which we live? And um, the politics of, um, of sexuality, of homosexuality, of uh, sexual uh, uh, freedom, and so on. Why? And the, the example of Daniel Gena is, is striking, but you never mention him, and I neither do I. And um, why is it so? And I know that you were uh, accused of uh, uh, labeling working class as racist, homophobic, and this is why it was the uh, same reproach that were addressed to me when my book uh, were uh, published. So we were we were to we face the same uh, kind of critique. And um, but maybe we 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 have to try to answer the critique and to to try to address the issue. And uh, um, as your job is uh, is. Uh, more recent than mine, um, I'm very struck that not only you you did not distantiate yourself from what I tried to, to say, that I could not survive in that milieu as a gay young man, and uh, not only you, 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 you did not distantiate yourself from what I wrote, but you reinforced, you 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 said more strongly, more uh, more harsh than I, than I did. And, and of course, because the novel gives you that, the, the, the freedom to do that, to do that but also because uh, your milieu was even poorer, uh, more working class, uh, uh, more destitute than, than mine. And um, you, you emphasize what I um, uh, delineate. And I'm struck by. Um, you don't distantiate yourself, you, you, don't, you don't try to reconcile the working class and the politics. But if I may, I mean one, one, uh, just, just one thing, one huge difference between your books is the perspective from which you're writing them. And yours is called Retour à, whereas this is called En Finir. Yeah. So, I mean, you're. It, it, it's, <laughs> As everybody has noticed, it's younger than you. He will return later. <laughs> Uh, the domination created violence. This is an idea of Bourdieu 
which is the principle of the conservation of violence, in when you are created by violence, when you are fascinated by violence, when you always live in violence, like the middle classes, you will create violence on others, on other categories. And uh, I, I wanted to point out that because I, I, I saw that when you published the book, it was unthinkable to say that a new childhood video was homophobic. And it, for me it was like incredible. It's like you, 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 there's a question you can't ask. You can't ask. It's impossible to ask it. And it's like a means, it's like this kind of old communist, you know, the, party, the French party communist in the 60s, for example. It, it was impossible to talk about uh, women or homosexuality because we say, when well, we will do the big revolution of uh, homosexuality will disappear, etc. Because it's yeah, a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we will, we will disappear. Yeah. You know, and, and it's this kind of, of category uh, are not dead, and it, it's still, and that's why we can hear this kind of well, we call it party line. It, it, was, it was not accepted when you published your book. Because you mean he's a tough guy, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, it was accepted. When, it wasn't accepted with what you wrote about uh, working class, uh, the work, working class media in which you, 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 live, you used to live during your childhood. It wasn't accepted when you said it is an autobiography. But when you said, oh, it's a novel, said, oh, of course it's a novel, nothing is true, but it's a novel, this is the freedom of the, of the novelist, you can uh, invent whatever you want. And you said, you, you said in an interview that you discovered that. Um, if you say it's a novel, everybody is okay. Oh, it's a novel. But if you well, well, this is in France, this is yeah, not. Yeah, it, 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 it was not accepted that you say when you say it is not a novel. And the scandal what you say it is a novel, but what what I describe is the novel is what I experienced, what I, the, 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 the what I what what was my own experience with it when you said that, and people were infuriated, they accusing me, accusing you of betraying your your social class or people who don't live in that social class or who used to live and um, uh, flew, uh, escaped from this class and who would have liked it well to, to, to stay there. And uh, this was very strange, the violence and uh, the novel is a kind of a, of a war, a protection war. And, um, and functioned as a protection war against violence of the critics who did not stand that um, Edward could say that what I described it was was what I experienced it was really truly and he um, uh, reflected on that in an interview it was very interesting that the scandal was um, when he said it was, it's a novel but it's, it's not a novel yeah, when you create this, this kind of link between uh, truth and literature, it was like, because at the beginning I was saying it's a novel, but I say that, as Didier said, that nobody cared about it. But when I said uh, uh, it's an autobiography, all I wrote, I did, I did it. Uh, and the, yes, the, the, reaction were, the reactions uh, were uh, more, more, more violent. And so to answer clearly the, the question, I think that maybe uh, to write a book like Gideon's book, it's the best way to reconcile the question of sexuality and the question of social classes. So the, the, the point is not to ignore the effects of domination, and particularly violence as an effect of domination, is to see how all these yes, mechanisms of domination uh, are put in together and create this kind of violence and violence over part of the popular classes against homosexuals. And uh, yes, so so a struggle would be a struggle uh, against uh, domination, but it's different dominations. And if we say, uh, so no, I want to reconcile it, so I want to ignore how can domination create violence, you don't reconcile nothing. You don't, you just dream about that. And it's, in a, it's a dream of the nature. It's a, 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 it's a,
of age is etc. The popular class who are so you know, and I think it's, it, it, it's yeah, it's very dangerous. It, it can be very dangerous. So so way to deal with would be that. Yeah. So um, do we? Did you? If I may ask something, I think there's something in common in your work is that the fact you have thoughts about the question of social shame make you more aware of the of the of the gay fear. Mm -hmm. And it, it was not that central in, in Didier's work so far. And I think it re-emerged with more power. Um, so th this is an articulation that might also explain the, difficult, the difficulty to reconcile um, these two, these two media, the, the direct, immediate fear. No, yeah. Thank you for lecturing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think that to, to, to try to think uh, both social uh, shame and sexual shame uh, is a way to, to you know, it's a, a sociological way of mind to it. Uh, you know, this person we were talking about who attacked Didier and attacked my group by saying, uh, uh, you say that the popular classes are more popular, blah, blah, blah. Uh, these kind of reactions are anti-sociological anti because uh, the sociological mind would create differences and would create differences with different models and so all these people who say it's uh, always the same it's always, which is not true it's an anti-sociologist uh, way of thinking and uh, you know for example when I introduced my book in, in, in bookshop etc people told me oh uh, maybe in a in, in Bourgeoisie family, uh, people, uh, two guys wouldn't have uh, beating you and, uh, uh, and spitting on you, uh, but uh, they would hate you. Uh, but maybe I prefer that. I prefer <laughs> to you know. It's incredible to, to go in the, you know. And uh, so the, the, this is a kind of returning to us. Uh, and what I try to say in my book is to, yes, to, 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 to do this. Job of making differences and making and, and see when domination creates what situation and creates what kind of violence and what kind of exclusion.